question up bay choose up the Clementine Bordeaux imachi up I'm Clementine Bordeaux uh, I'm a enrolled member of the Sichangu Oyate and I grew up on the Pine Ridge Reservation so I come to you as a Lakota scholar sister niece cousin auntie friend um, and I work diligently to model myself as Kuliyam which means guest um, to Tongva and to Taviam land and um, I think that's something we should all be doing, um, especially as we have this wonderful panel that's talking about relationality and kinship. So today um, I am talking about a silent powwow for missing, murdered, and indigenous women, a site of indigenous performance as a way to map resistance. Uh, in 2016, Marita Groin Thunder began a year-long project called Save Our Sisters, Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls and she did this in Polson, Montana. The aim of Save Our Sisters was to bring attention to the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic across North America. Groin Thunder, a Fort Peck Assiniboine tribal member, crafted and wore a cultural dress every day of her senior year of high school in honor of MMIW. At the end of the school year, she organized a silent powwow, displaying 80 dresses and stating that this is where these women would have been if they weren't missing or murdered. My paper explores the production of the dresses and the curation of the silent powwow as an alternative roadmap through settler colonialism. The paper outlines realities of MMIW that can be contextualized through discussions of precarity as articulated through violence, death, and loss. I discuss necropolitical frameworks as formulated by settler nation states and demonstrate that the logics of the settler colonial state deem indigenous women and girls as disposable. Finally, I examine Groin Thunder's labor through the creation of the dresses and the curation of the powwow. In 2016, the same year that Groin Thunder began her project in Montana, Canada launched a national inquiry into missing and murdered indigenous women the inquiry lasted about three years and concluded with a final report that provides data regarding the conditions of MMIW, as well as what I would think of as lame calls for justice. I must note that prior to the fall of 2019, there had been little to no intention to MMIW here in the United States. So I will be turning to Canada a lot because there's a lot more movement um, across the um, country there as opposed to here in the United States. But I will say in November of last year, the 45th president administration issued an executive order to establish their own task force on missing and murdered American Indian and Alaskan natives. However, um, as we will see across this entire conference, structural inquiries, especially by the United States, are a prime example of the disposability of indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit communities. Settler states like Canada and the United States have dealt with indigenous communities in a variety of ways and can be understood um, through these structures. Ultimately, the disruption of kinship or relational connection has it, resulted in a lasting impact of trauma. Membe, building on a Foucauldian analysis, introduces the concept of necropolitics which is situated in a franchise colony as opposed to a settler colony, but I turn to this framework because it provides a variety of ideas regarding the states of siege and exception. Understanding that the political is not detached from power and that both rely on the control of bodies helps lays a solid foundation to theorize how indigenous bodies, especially women, are disposed of within these settler states. Membe gives examples of how the creation of the savage body is really the animal. Operating within the pro that framework, I see the indigenous woman body as cloaked in terror because it is seen as animal. Indigenous women are continuously viewed only as flesh, dehumanized, and er erased across the settler landscape. Marita's work draws attention to the body through her making and creating. There is extensive black feminist scholarship that has theorized about the flesh, the human, and the creation of the other, and I acknowledge that work is important to this larger gender discourse, uh, but I turn specifically to um, how settler nations are treating indigenous women because often we're erased even within these larger discourses and narratives. 
In a place like Montana, power mon manifests through racial tensions that are masked by neoliberal models of governmentality. A project like Growing Thunders pushes the boundaries of how indigenous women should be governed. The neoliberal or late liberal model as, artic as articulated by Elizabeth Povinelli states that the social divisions of tents that help shape how social belonging, abandonment, and endurance are experienced within late liberalism impact, well, I would say impact Native women. So if we think about the United States, which has about one to 2% indigenous population, a place like Montana boasts po indigenous population at 6.5%, which is really large for a very large landmass. In a state that is majority, but still majority white, a lar the large indigenous population is criminalized and the criminalization of indigenous women bodies is rampant, and, but also coded as someone else's responsibility. The Save Our Sisters project is on trend with movements across North America where Indian women face homicide at higher rates in the United States, usually by an intimate non-native partner. When indigenous woman goes missing, the search for her is often left to either tribal state or federal care. In a state like Montana that is under public law 280, jurisdiction is transferred from tribal to federal law enforcement to the state authority. The, complic the complicated mess of the government often leaves American Indian women either victimized or ignored. The Save Our Sisters project was imagined and created near the Flathead Indian Reservation, uh, but Polson is just off the reservation, so where Marita was um, geographically located, what had a high population of Native people, but still predominantly white. Although Marita is not an enrolled member of Flathead, she had been organizing and living the realities of the com complicated tribal state and federal navigation of Amer American Indian women in Montana. The simple act of Marita wearing a cultural dress every day to school agitated a space of whiteness. Her intentions were not to create adversity, but to draw attention to the unsettled nature of MMIW. The intimacy, so Marita states, when you wear a skirt, you wear it to be honest, to be your true self. The intimacy of each dress can be articulated in a variety of ways, through the choice of contemporary fabric, the labor of sewing, and the design. As a young indigenous woman, she has navigated the potential of becoming a part of the MMIW, not only as an advocate, but a potential victim. The dress making for her is intimate. In the beginning, each dress was made in honor of a woman that was missing or murdered, but it became too overwhelming because the number was incredibly high. So people would message her on Facebook, they would text her, they would email her with a name. So in the beginning, like the first few months, she would make a dress and think of this woman as she made the dress. And then it, that became too over, emotionally overwhelming for her. Each dress takes anywhere from 90 minutes to six hours, depending on how intricate it is and she would create this every night. She was also in band, she's like an honor roll student, so she would like go to band practice, do her homework, and then her and her mother would make the dresses every night. Um, Lisa Lowe provides an intimate way to read these complicated histories. Lowe offers differing concepts of intimacy as understood through politics, economies, and culture that are impacted by colonialism. Marita is bringing her Assiniboy, Kiowa, Comanche, um, world views to this making, ultimately a tribal plains view, which I would argue is aesthetically pleasing because I'm a plains person. Um, and women on the plains, I, you know, historically would have to be able to raise our teepees um, alone. Um, and those are our temporary dwellings historically. So while also like showing off beautiful adornment. So I think Marita's intimate embodiment of these dresses is a way to understand the intimacies of a, being intertribal, but also creating new ways of reading a temporal connection, not only to design pre-contact, but to a contemporary space um, of like satin ribbon. Growing Thunder maps a way to navigate contemporary colonial inclusion through the wearing and making of her dresses. The ribbon skirt represents an ongoing radical resistance against colonialism that includes struggle for land, self-determination, healing historical trauma, cultural continuity and reconciliation.
The dresses that adorn her body create an intimate symbol that requires an acknowledgement of the violence that occurred for a woman to go missing while also a radical reimagining of the temporal, temporality of indigenous women in the settler state. The gender labor of, that Marita produces is a necessity to her own survival. As Robin Kelly states, unless we have the space to imagine and a vision of what it means to fully realize our humanity, all the protests and demonstrations in the world won't bring about our liberation. The dresses displayed at the powwow map a way to imagine indigenous space through contemporary cultural practices and understand the discursive realities of MMIW. The silent powwow offers a lens through which to analyze gender-based violence. Conversations of aesthetic and itinerant remains to understand the display of the dresses is important. So a modern inner tribal powwow represents a social gathering that typically brings together a variety of tribal nations of shared song, dance, arts, and cultures. So Marita's use of the powwow grounds to memorialize and draw attention to MMIW through her dresses create what um, Nguyen Vo, quoting Damien Sutton, calls a temporal loop. An audience can interact with the dress, but are constantly reminded of what is missing in that empty dress. Is the empty dress on the chair grandma that is supposed to be watching her grandchild dance in the tiny tot category, which is my favorite? Is the dress hanging near the grand entry gate, the auntie that everyone is so envious because of her stylish beadwork? Is the dress hanging with the shawl, the cousin that everyone borrows their footwork from? Again, Robin Kelly posits, what are today's young activists dreaming about? I imagine growing thunder's dream as a rupture of the politic politicization that shifts social consciousness through an indigenous model of queer feminisms. The silent powwow as a performance piece re reflects the shadow of indigenous women across settler colonial landscapes. Art and Marita's labor draw attention to MI MMIW because often the language or the imagination needed to clearly articulate loss or death do not always feel adequate to us. The empty dresses reveal the deaths that have occurred but shifts understanding of the deaths that will not come because this is where the women would be if they were not missing or murdered. Thank you.